hello everyone. Uh, welcome again. So I'm very happy to introduce today uh, Mohamed Sarif. Uh, he's an attending psychiatrist as well as an assistant professor at Brown University. Uh, he did his MD PhD at SUNY Downstate uh, with Bill Litton, where I met him uh, several years ago. And since then, we've sort of been working together and in recent years working even more closely, which I'm very happy about. And today he's going to talk about some of his work using NetPine. And please welcome everyone, Mohamed um, Sarif. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, so for the, for the opportunity, like I, I still remember my first like neuron uh, course uh, many many years ago, and like I was like one of the students there, and then like now like coming and like giving this talk, it's a nice uh, like um, coming back for like closing the closing the circle. Um, so I'll start by just like my my uh, conflicts of interest. So I do some consulting work for a company called the Silico Biosciences. It's a company that uses computer models to uh, understand or like to come up with. Uh, uh, or to understand the, pharm the pharmacological action of different medications based on simulations based on, on receptors. But I'm not going to talk about that uh, project today. Uh, what I want to illustrate you, like during today's talk is that modeling can help us reach otherwise unattainable insights about the neurobiology of psychiatric disease and their treatment. And uh, a, a quick note about like about the the un like otherwise unattainable like this for sure like this changes depending on like the technology. So like something that are otherwise unattainable today in ten years might be uh, attainable. Uh, but for for now, like like how to get such insights from patients uh, um, as they are getting their treatment is the main thing I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I like to usually start with acknowledgments. What I'm going to talk about today is how we uh, try to understand the effects of a medication that we use to treat depression. So it's a treatment study. And for that, we are using EEG, and we're using computer simulations to infer what are the microcircuit changes happening in the neocortex. And so it has like it, like it has like this like three 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 parts, and for each part, there is a there's a team that I'm very very grateful for, to be working with. So for the EEG and the treatment studies, but for Hannah, it's just like thanking our patients and their families for allowing us to do this like this kind of of research. Uh, and for the EEG and the treatment studies, we have uh, the like a, a group, the synergy group of schizophrenia and neuro research group at Yale uh, that I was working with before, where uh, we're doing the treatments, the, the treatments and recording the EEG. Uh, for the computer mechanistic modeling uh, piece, uh, Stephanie's work and Dylan and Black, uh, Blake uh, developing HNN. Uh, Salvador developing the HNN, uh, the NetPine version of HNN, and Mustafa Zakaria is a second year psychiatry resident uh, at Penn State who has been working with me over the past few years learning how to use modeling and recently working that particular project. Uh, and for sure, like all of all the funding um, opportunities that allowed this allowed me to to have to do both the clinical work as well as using simulations and I'm highlighting here this R21 a grant that we just received in March uh, that which is um, which I'm going to talk about today so this work has been the preliminary work that we proposed in, in the R21 and we are very very grateful that we, that it got funded uh, so my assumption as a physician scientist in psychiatry is that the brain is the interface where all the different uh, factors interact together. So whether the whether these factors are psychological factors, uh, social factors interacting with other brains or other people, as well as uh, biological, so like genetic or pharmacological, or other like like spiritual aspects. So the brain is the interface for all of these. So I'm not saying that the brain is is what equates us, like a brain is equal to human beings. It's a complete, like this is a very deep philosophical discussion that we can discuss later on, but at, but for now, it's at least it's the interface for the different uh, factors that affect who we are. Uh, the outline we're gonna talk about today, I'll start by going an over overview of brain microcircuit computer modeling and like why, why do we need that? And then to make it a bit more con more concrete, I'll give an analogy with uh, using Google Maps as a conceptual analogy for for using the models. Uh, 
uh, I'll then uh, discuss the project that we have uh, from uh, like a, a giving like a bit of a like a short clinical background and then uh, like the EEG piece and then the uh, simul like the simulation piece. All of this is going to be very very pre preliminary, so we don't have that much clinical data. We don't have that much simulation, but I'm going to explain like what like how how we thought about this when we started like working on this project like a couple of years ago, until it got funded uh, two months ago. And then uh, I have a few slides to just like wrap it. Multiple levels. So we have our we have uh, behavior that results from the interaction of the different parts of the brain, whether it's like different regions of the neocortex or hippocampus or subcortical structures. And talk. And since I'm going to talk today about the neocortex, I'm like focusing just on the on the neocortex here. If we look at the neocortex, it has this. Uh, like canonical six layer structure or four layer structure depending on, on like whether you are in a granular or granular uh, area of the new cortex and uh, it consists of a, like usually like layer two three pyramidal layers a pyramidal layer a layer four stellate cells and then like layer five and, and layer six pyramidal layers uh, I, I'm gonna remove like the, the histology part, part and just focus on this on the schematic uh, if we took the the like the individual uh, neuron, it, like the complexity that it has, uh, whether for the like for the uh, the 3D shape that that that, that the neuron that the neuron has, or uh, delving it deeper into like uh, or like closer to the cell membrane, the, the structure of the of the different channels it has, the uh, different uh, um, pumps that that it has, the different receptors it it has. Uh, and also focusing on the connect connections between the different neurons, so like ha at the level of uh, synapses and the uh, individual spines. So here you can see like a postsynaptic terminal coming onto a glutamatergic spine, um, moving and, and like and noting that all of this information is encoded in the underlying genome. The, the 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 like these like different levels uh, and the various elements in it multiple like different elements in them are abnormal in different psychiatric orders. So we have the symptoms at the behavioral level. Uh, we have abnormal connectivity between different regions. Uh, the changes in the in the neural subpopulations in different disorders. Uh, moving uh, to loss of dendritic arborization and spines. Uh, changes in channel in, in channels, for example, like uh, multiple studies have shown that it seems that calcium channels seem to be abnormal in schizophrenia, uh, and we know that schizophrenia and OCD are highly heritable. So I think I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to show is like ha, like is give a, a quick overview of like how complex the, the what we're trying to study is. Um, and our medications work at the like at more at the molecular level, and we're and they help at the behavioral level. And so there are multiple levels of understanding that we need to traverse in order to get an idea of how the uh, of how the medications would help with the symptoms that we're seeing. Um, and in the, what add uh, like another layer of complexity is that we use various tools to look at each of these levels in different species. So we have questionnaires and evaluations when looking at the behavioral uh, uh, or like extract to, to extract behavioral data. Uh, we look at EEG or MEG or fMRI to look at whole brain and like whole brain connectivity. Uh, we, we can insert electrodes in the brain, whether in, in humans or in human patients or in animal models. Um, uh, Mainly in animal models, we can extract the 3D geometry of the individual neurons. Uh, so, like we can uh, have uh, like image the the three the their 3D geometry. Um, we can do like very large studies of, of DNA called like uh, for example like uh, GWA studies or like genome wide association studies, having thousands of patients and the relatives and healthy controls to get to what are the regions within the DNA that might be correlated with increased risk for particular illness. And so, uh, like what the, the way I see it is that the microcircuit models are at, uh, are at this interface between the different levels that go from a molecular level where our medications work to the symptom level at the behavioral level. And so this is why we, we mainly focus on the microcircuit model, at least like in, 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 my, in my lab and in our research. 
uh, and like the, the, the notion of like like simulations, uh, I, I like the like the, the like this image of showing how if we mathematically describe the different elements of a car and including properties for how, for example, the rubber of the tire would uh, react to uh, forces and like the, the, the metal the metal of the doors, the different the different uh, parts of an engine, how we can just by a mathematical presentation of all of that or, or mathematical and computational presentation of all of that, we can actually simulate crashes and save like thousands of cars. Like we don't have to crash cars in order to investigate the safety features. We can actually crash a car, modify, modify certain features and then, and then test whether this feature improved the safety or not. And similarly, we can, we, uh, like in, in microcircuit modeling, we usually start with uh, mo like with mathematical presentations for 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 how a soma would would react to voltage, and we can add uh, other compartments so uh, to to represent the writes, make multiple copies of that to make to create other uh, net other neural subpopulations connected uh, using what we know from the from the from the literature from experiments. Uh, add different details, for example, at the synaptic level, insert different channels in, in, in the membrane, and uh, record the activity from all of this that then can would get reflected in MEG, EEG, or fMRI. And I think this is what you have been doing like, like during the course, like you're using NetPine in order to do all of that. Uh, and what, like, the, what I like about this approach so much is, is that like all the all the all our assumptions are there and they are they are there explicitly so it's not just like hand waving okay like the, when i we increase this medication this like neuronal rate firing increase like no like when we increase which like like with like which uh, medication at which receptor and which region which neuron so like you have to become you have to be very very explicit in all all the assumptions that you're making and in so many cases we don't know so like and, and if we so if we know it like we implement but if we don't know then we make certain choices and these choices can become the research problems that you're working on uh, one of like one of my favorite quotes quotes from uh, like IBM's uh, software our software architecture uh, uh, sorry architect Frederick Brooks is incompleteness and inconsistencies of ideas only become clear during implementation so we can so like we have multiple hypotheses about like how schizophrenia happened for example like dopaminergic and like uh, like glutamatergic and like GABAergic and this is all like very nice conceptually but there there will be gaps in this un, in our understanding of how do each of these different neurotransmitter affect symptoms but these such gaps are not going to be clear without actually okay let's implement what we think about uh, like effect of dopamine and schizophrenia in a computer model. And that's, let's use the same model and implement what happens with glutamate, and then use the same model to implement what happens with GABA. So we have a model that's trying to integrate together all what we know so far, as well as highlight the gaps in our understanding. Uh, questions so far before we go to the next one? Okay, uh, I'm sorry. So like, the, there are some some birds singing outside my window. Is it? Like, do I need we to close this. the window? Okay. Is it uh, easier if I close the window? Whatever. It's not too bad. So. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now, now moving to like how how to think of like just like again a conceptual analogy uh, for people who are not very familiar with with like ha like using using modeling in that pers in like a, a, a clinical or pharmacological perspective. Uh, so just similar like this is from uh, from New Haven where I used to work there a few years ago. This is what like the VA hospital where I, I I used to work, and this is another place where I need to go to. And like just like all of us have used Google Maps or like whatever navigation app that we that we that we use, it highlights different uh, routes for, to go from one place to another. And similarly to like how Google Maps help us to find directions from point A to point B, uh, you can think of computer models of a microcircuit as a way to go to identify mechanisms of how we can reach from medications to symptoms. Uh, and similar to Google Maps, where they have multiple kinds of information that has to be integrated to reach like such 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 a map, like for example, like high, highway maps, uh, uh, street maps, real-time traffic data, 
uh, bus and train schedules, you, you, we, you integrate all of this into a map and trying to answer the question, how do I get from point A to point B? And it gives you suggest directions. And in order to be able to get to that map, you have to integrate all of the information if that, that, that I just highlighted and, and, and much more. You can think of similarly that in order for us to come up with a hypothesis of how does a medication work in a particular condition and it gives us suggested mechanisms or such as hypotheses, we would use the computer models to integrate as well multiple types of data about cells, connections between the cells, the molecular response to medications, and so forth. So you can think of computer models as a, as a, as a map to uh, navigate across the different levels going from the molecular level all the way up to uh, like 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 more more complex. I don't, I'm not gonna say all the way to symptoms, but like all the way to like more complex representations. Um, now, com like coming to, to like to the like the actual R twenty one grant that that we that that we got the the uh, and a, a little bit of like a clinical piece. So what would the the we are we, we were trying to investigate how the what what would be the underlying mechanism of ketamine when used uh, in treatment of treatment resistant depression. So by treatment resistant depression, we usually uh, mean it's a failure of two treatments in the current depressive episode. So let me just like un unpack this a little bit. So in the current depressive episode, so when a patient comes with se with severe depression, so they have they have been crying most of the time, or they have been they lost their interest in doing things, or they don't have energy, or their sleep is mar is markedly interrupted, or they cannot think of anything else but suicide because, like, it's just like it's it's too painful just to keep alive. This would be considered as this is a, a depressive episode, uh, and we usually give medications like Zoloft or Prozac, which is like the SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, when we give like two different medications and there is failure of two of these medications or two different classes, this is when we consider it as treatment resistant depression. So it's a depression that has been resistant to the treatments we've, can, we, we've given so far. And unfortunately, uh, a third of, of patients are not helped by like Zoloft or, or Prozac. So like you, if you like give multiple medication, you're still going to end up with a third of, of patients who do not respond to these medications. And this is where ketamine came into play. So ketamine is a molecule that has was discovered, I think, in the in the sixties as a part as part of, uh, as like a as a derivative from from PCP from fencyclopine, and uh, it's it has been like approved to you to be used as as an anesthetic. So usually, most like mostly in, in children. So when if somebody like like unfortunately has like a broken leg and they need to like give a medication that's gonna ease the pain as well as like put them in a dissociative state so that like they don't experience the pain as severe they give ketamine and ketamine is an NAD receptor blocker. In 2000, uh, the Yale and the, and the Connecticut VA uh, published a paper that's considered like now like a single paper in the field where they showed that a sub anesthetic dose uh, can result in a rapid antidepressant effect within 24 hours. So usually antidepressants would work. It, it takes usually a few weeks for it for for like Prozac or Zoloft to work. So and it has been something that's unfortunate that uh, like like in depression you cannot resolve depression quickly uh, without like going to something like electrical pulse therapy or shock therapy, which you can help like resolving the depression within a week or so. But like a medication that has not been like heard of before ketamine. Um, the 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 like ha having such an effect allowed us or like gave us hope that okay it might be possible to actually ha like get much closer to the neurobiology of depression so we, so that we're we're resolving the depressive symptoms again within 24 hours uh, fast forward 19 years we got, finally got the approval for a form of ketamine that's given intranasally uh, for for depression so before that ketamine has been all all the time used as an aesthetic and some people were using it as an antidepressant, but it was because there was called like an off label. So it's not FDA approved to be used this way. However, in March 2019, Jensen got the approval of a form of ketamine that's given intranasally. Uh, looking at like how does ketamine work, like how, how it might be helping in, in depression, uh, if, you, if you take a look at the spines, a lot like the dendritic spines uh, of. Uh, the, for example, like here, the the apical dendrites of a layer five pyramidal neuron, you like you can see these like like protrusions, which are 
the spines. And then in animal models, when you do uh, chronic unpredictable stress, you find that there is a reduction in the in the in this like in the number of these spines. So like there's atrophy of the spines as well as like we see because like at, even atrophy of the dendrites. And a single dose of ketamine was able to restore this uh, like like the, the the number of spines back. And this is how we think that uh, at least in animal models that this how a single dose of ketamine might help with to, might help with, to produce this rapid within 24 hours, antidepressant effect. The, the, question, the main question that we're trying to answer use, using the grant is a single dose, as I mentioned, yes, it can have an antidepressant effect within 24 hours. However, the antidepressant effect goes away within three to seven days. And this is why you have to give repeated dosing. However, if you give repeated doses, so like six treatments over, so like twice a week over three weeks, Actually, the antidepressant effect can last for a few weeks. And like one of our patients, for example, like, like, the, like the, he got like six treatments and you got an antidepressant effect that lasted for four months. So, so like you're not giving any more ketamine here. So like you're, you've stopped at the same time point, but for some reason giving repeated doses result in the maintenance of the, of the effect. And this is what we were trying to answer, like what, like why, like what, what might be underlying, what might be happening at the microcircuit level, in the neocortex at the microcircuit level, that can explain uh, the, the maintained antidepressant effect. And so, so, so far, like the animal data suggests that a single ketamine treatment would result in increased number of spines here, like in, in green. So we thought that there are probably like two possible hypotheses. Uh, the first is that the the repeated dosing would result in increased number of sp of spines further, so, and this is why you have many more of them, and this is why it takes longer time for them to atrophy back, and this is why you get this and maintain antidepressant effect. The other possibility that's based, <coughs> like on like the effects of ketamine on uh, like uh, neuronal uh, cell cultures, is that it might increase the dendritic growth and dendritic complexity, and this is why you have infrastructure that is. <clears throat> more resilient, and is why it takes longer time. And so this this is the like these are the two hypotheses that we are trying to test using the combination of EEG and modeling. So what what we're going to like the, like uh, as as a quick overview of the, of the study, what we would do is we're gonna have the patient and record EEG before the ketamine treatment. And record EEG after, uh, um, and I'm sorry, and and we're going to record also after as well. But this, the role of the simulation comes into play here. So based on the EEG before the ketamine, we're going to use HNN, uh, like the human neuropathic solver that Dr. Stephanie Jones uh, developed, and like she spoke about it this morning, uh, to 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 sit, like to kind of like to get a baseline, like or like a depressed model of HNN. And then we're going to develop two models. One of them has increased number of spines, and then the other has increased the dirt complexity. And then we're going to compare this back to the patient data after ketamine. And this way, you, it will be a way to infer what might be the changes that are happening at, at the new cortical level without having a brain biopsy, without, have, like, without opening the, brains, the, the, the patient's skull. So the way I think about it is like, like similar to like having having like a light microscope and having an electron microscope, you might have like a computational microscope of some sort. So it's a it's a way to use the the, the, the computational techniques to look at the EEG signal in a way that can allow us to infer the microcircuit changes. Uh, there is an important question that we that we had to address first, like what would be the EEG signal that we would record that would reflect the change that's happening in the dendrites to start with. So for that, we used uh, uh, like an, e, uh, an EEG long-term potentiation task or EEG LTP task. Uh, so the, 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 the task depends on generating uh, LTP, long-term potentiation, in the, in, in the spines within like 12 minutes. So as I'm gonna describe like in the next slide, the, like you, you, you induce an LTP in these patients using uh, auditory tetanus. So like repeated, like repeated like tones or repeated leaps uh, that uh, the patient listened to at a particular frequency. 
And what this has, like, this has shown, like, I think like, the first paper that described using this technique was 2005, that uh, when you do an, like a titanic, stimu a titanic stimulation similar to, like, similar to such a literary tone, you're inserting more amp receptors. And so you'll be able to get a, a dendritic signal just based on the changes within the, within the spines. So the first step is to get the AEG L, like LTP signal, and then the second step will be the, the modeling. For the first step, we start by recording a recording auditory ERP or event ready potential. So for that, patients would listen to a hundred tone pips, and uh, after, uh, and then we average we like we we average the EEG from uh, or the EEG response for each of these hundred tone pips, and so whatever noise or whatever that's not time blocked to the tone pip would get averaged out and the uh, the 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 time blocked activity will be um, will be augmented and so this is what this is when when we get what like what's considered like as a, like a as a like a primary sensory ERP uh, so here the x axis is time, the y axis is the voltage, e voltage, and here the volt. Then in this particular figure, the EEG voltage, the negative one is upward, like this used to be the convention in the past. And so usually you get like three peaks, so like P one or the positive peak, the first positive peak, and then N one or the N like the first negative peak, and then the P two uh, or the second P uh, second positive peak. Or this usually like if, if we call it like with duration with like. T uh, Time-wise, we the P1 will be the P50, so the uh, positive deflection happening at 50 milliseconds. N1 is the N100, so it's the negative deflection happening at 100 milliseconds. And then P2 or P200, positive deflection happening at 200 milliseconds. And what uh, Clapp and his group showed in 2005 is that if you do a auditory tetanus at 13 hertz, and then record the record the uh, the like like redid the auditory ERPs. You're gonna find an increase in the amplitude of the N100. So again, this is just like this is within two minutes. So like you're recording like pre as pre the tetanus, and then you do two minutes of tetanus, and then you record them again. Uh, so this increase in the N100 is what has been considered a, like a like a, a signal that reflects a, like long term potentiation and like in, in, in many papers after the, after that uh, in humans as well as in animals they show that it has similar features to LTP like being for example like being blocked by an NMDA blocker or if you do like uh, like uh, less frequent stimulation similar to like LTD you start losing this effect so it's a long term depression uh, so we, we 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 are using this task in order to get a dendritic uh, like a, an EEG dendritic change, which we are focused. With the, our focus will be here on the N100. So the N100 would be the changes that would be induced by the task, and then we're going to assess how much of this change is happening before ketamine versus after ketamine. And for, for that, uh, our patients are going to receive sex ketamine treatments. We're going to record EEG uh, before the first ketamine. And so we're going to have an N100 before LTP and N100 after LTP before the first ketamine dose, after the first ketamine dose, and then after the sixth or the last ketamine dose. Uh, the, the, what, what, we, like what, what we have shown with the, with the, uh, with the uh, with, with, with in like in our pre preliminary data, so this is data from one, one patient who has responded to ketamine and one patient who did not respond to ketamine. So for the responder, for the responder patient, again, this, this is going to be an ERP figure. X, X is the time, X axis is the time, Y axis is the amplitude microvolts, but here positive is towards the top. So the N100 would be towards the negative. What we have seen, what we have seen is that before, like at baseline, so before ketamine treatment, uh, you the N100 does not change, so like the the black pre tetanus and the red post tetanus do not vary that much. And usually the way that we calculate the N100 amplitude is from the uh, trough to the previous peak. So if you go from like the red and the blue, the, the red trough to the red uh, peak, it's more or less the same as the black trough to the black peak. After ketamine uh, uh, treatment and the patient has responded, so like like many of his like more than more than fifty percent improvement in his depressive symptoms, this is what we call a, a response. 
we get an increase of around 50% of the N100. So this is the same subject uh, three weeks later uh, after, after their symptoms got better. So here we have uh, on the y-axis like the percent change in the responder. And in another patient who was a non-responder, we saw almost no change. So this guy that still they received ketamine, but they have not responded to, to ketamine. So we're trying to get at what are the changes in the neocortex that are responsible for the, that antidepressant effect of ketamine. And this is what the grant is about. Uh, now moving to the second step, which is the neocortical modeling part. Uh, so we're we, again we're using the human neocortical neurosolver. Uh, I know that like you've got a, like you've got a primer about it today. I'm just going to do like a quick refresher of like how like how the how the, the the model can explain the changes that happens in the, in the different peaks. So we have here the P50. Uh, I'm sorry. There's a bit of a lag between moving the mouse and the and the uh, and the uh, marker. So apologize for that. Uh, so we have the uh, P50 and then N100 and then P200. So there's a, a like a, the current going up, and the current going down, and the current going up again. And the the model has uh, layer two, three primal neurons, as well as layer five primal neurons. And the way that the model responds to an input uh, that's coming from the thalamus to layer four is that after layer four, uh, which is not represented in the model, but what we uh, Simulate is the effect on layer two, three, and layer five. So we have the firing of the somas. Uh, there is a back propagating action potential that goes upwards towards the skull, and this is how we get a P50, the, the positive deflection at 50 milliseconds. After that, because of the firing, uh, the ex, like the, the 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 spikes go either to through the cortical straight the cortical pathway or through other cortical regions, and you get spikes distally. Uh, at, at the distal apical dendrites. And this would generate uh, like an EPSP that then uh, have a current that goes down down the, down the dendrites. And this is what, how you get the N100. And so based on this understanding, the increase in the N100 that we're seeing with the treatment seems to show that there might be something happening distally in the apical dendrites. And this is where we're modeling our, our changes uh, whether it's increased number of spines or increased dendritic arborization. Uh, so, uh, um, so Mustafa Khalil uh, ha, has uh, like uh, made, made, made this figure where we're uh, in uh, red is the responder, the patient data. So, like this would be the P50. This would this would be the N100. This would be the P200 in red, and then the simulation, we're simulating five trials here in gray, and the average of these five trials is in black. And the first thing to do would be to try to uh, optimal, like uh, calibrate the model so that we generate, the, for, for each patient, we generate an, you know, like a model for that, for that particular patient. Uh, an advantage of using HNN and uh, uh, the, the NetPy inversion is that like we can, whatever changes that we want to test, we can like we can what we can update the model or we can modify or we can use the model to to optimize the changes that we want to see and in a, uh, the an advantage for HNN is that we can then also look at the uh, the the firing dynamics of the different uh, uh, neuronal populations so here in in white you have the layer two three basket cells in green you have the layer two three primal neurons in uh, blue, you have the layer five basket, and then in red, you have the layer five primal. And this, like this firing pattern, is what would result in the uh, in the shape that you're seeing here in gray. That's averaged out in the in the in the black curve. Uh, just again, very very preliminary work from from the simulations. Uh, it seems that when we increase the like the 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 the, the like the growth and like with the way that we modeled it here was uh, like increasing the, 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 the synchrony of the or increasing the convergence ratio from the net stem objects uh, to the different uh, neurons uh, like I'm assuming that like you're now a bit familiar with like net stem uh, you, like f f because it has been a, a week through the course and it seems what we what we see is that increasing the dendritic growth 
would result in a larger amplitude of the N100. So you can see here in blue, this was this is a more dendritic the connections. There is an increase uh, in the amplitude that results from such a dendritic growth. So this this might be uh, like like this supports what like the hypothesis that we had before, but we were happy to see it in like in, in a simulation. And so what we uh, like 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 wrapping like wrapping this project up, uh, what we were planning to do again as a, as a summary is we're going to get the patient data before the treatment, do a simulation that's that corresponds to that to this data, and then have have uh, have a model that represents the increased number of spines, and, the, and then a model that has increased dendritic complexity, and then compare this to what we see will see in patients' data after the treatment. Uh, how can how can this approach help? The the way I see it is that it's an opportunity to like peek into the academy's therapeutic changes, and that's again like a like a, like you can think of it as like a computational microscope. It's a way to look at the neocortex microcircuitry in in, in details that I think uh, like in living patients uh, that is extremely difficult uh, otherwise without opening their skull, for example. Uh, hopefully, like if 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 like. Like this was only a single in two patients. If like we're repeating it, and like we're going to be recruiting uh, twenty eight more patients you, with with a grant, if the signal it like like stays and like like we actually like does not get uh, diluted or like we lose it as we have like more patients, it can can act as a biomarker as as we're like developing molecules to reduce or prevent the relapse because like now we know what are the changes and so we can look at what would be the uh, um, the molecular targets that we can use in order to induce the, either the increase in the number of sp to maintain the increased number of spines or to maintain the uh, dendritic complexity or or both, uh, as well as can act as like a, a biomarker for for response. So this, so like pa instead of like patients coming and receiving ketamine every let's say like as maintenance like every like four weeks, it might be the possibility that a patient would come and get an EEG, and then if we see these changes, then like the changes are still maintained, then we don't give ketamine this visit. If the changes are lost, then we like they would need a uh, like a, a maintenance treatment or maintenance dose or boosting dose. Uh, coming and like like wrapping wrapping up, and I think I'm, I'm I think I'm, I'm doing okay on time so far. Uh, so uh, some like like people might say like well like this is not connectivity. Like connectivity based, like like the brain is highly connected, and like you're just focusing on a single microcircuit, and I agree, and like this is why like the future directions would be to include more than one microcircuit. However, we we get a like the advantage that we get is like this is mechanistic, so like like you can use a lot, like you can like you don't the, the way I see it, you don't need microcircuit modeling if what you're trying to do is to predict, uh, for example, like. EEG that correlates more with depression versus EEG that correlates more with OCD. Like, if this is what you're trying to do, just get like large data, like large data sets of EEG for patients, large data sets for EEG for controls, and run what like your favorite machine learning algorithm on them to separate them both. So you don't need that. However, if you're trying to uh, have it develop an intervention, whether its intervention is a recept is like a is a receptor manipulation with a pharmacology, whether it's uh, its manipulation of the uh, like excitability, for example, using uh, neuromodulation, you need the mechanistic details. Uh, otherwise, you, you don't need them. So, like, if, if again, if what you're interested in is prediction or categorization you don't, or classifying, you don't need this approach. But if you need to do to develop intervention or to test the intervention or to understand how intervention works, you would need such mechanistic details. And like go, coming back, like coming back to like the the Google Maps. Uh, here is a shot from uh, Boston, like in, in like in, in, in like really like bad traffic. Uh, we can identify that, for, like for example, like that this locate like this exit is what's causing a lot of the a lot of the back backup. Okay, like like we identified the exit. However, what are we going to do? It depends on like what's happening at that exit. So, for example, if there if there's construction, then like. There's nothing you can do. You have to wait until the construction ends. If there is like a traffic, uh, like a tree, sorry, across across the street, then you have to go and like remove the tree. Uh, if there's an accident, you have to like make sure the people are safe. Start removing the cars. So it's again, it's because of the intervention. If you want to know like where the construction is, yes, you don't need this level of detail. However, if you want to develop a, an, an intervention, you would need this level of detail. 
so I like I, like uh, coming back to the notion of like how different like how that the gaps would be uh, would be identified or clarified when we start implementing. Uh, like if we think of like the like the 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 neurobiology of the of depression as a map, and like here we are, and like I'm trying to understand how does make how does ketamine help with it as a depressant, we can start developing other other uh, uh, models for how the different uh, factors affect depression, like uh, for example, adverse childhood experiences, how ECT or electroconvulsive therapy and TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation help with that, how different psychotherapies help with depression. So all of these would be ways to like, like uh, or like, if we have models for each of these would be ways to understand the full neurobiology. So like, like cover the territory or like clarify the territory of the neurobiology of depression. Uh, I wanted to to thank you so much for for the, for this opportunity. Uh, I like I think it's an exciting area to get into. I think like NetPine is something that like many of my students are are using now. Like we're we're using, uh, and I want to wrap up with another quote that I I, I like uh, from um, uh, like um, Richard Dawkins. I'm uh, sorry, not Richard Dawkins. Sorry, uh, Richard Feynman's. Uh, Celtic black, blackboard, like what I cannot create, I do not understand. So if we're trying to understand the neurobiology of depression or of OCD or of schizophrenia, we need to be, have the, to implement the changes or we really need to be able to uh, build up a model of what, of what our understanding is so far. And if the model is able to replicate the data, then that's good. If it's unable to replicate the data, that's even much better because this, this would highlight the uh, gaps in our understanding that we need to go back and like do experiments to fill these gaps in. And thank, thank you for your time. And happy to have questions if there are any, either now or, or later on. And thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, I really like your, your analogies. <laughs> the map is so really <laughs> helpful. I think thank you have you. some questions here. Oh, sure. Shall oh. I put the chat? Go, go ahead. Hi, um, great talk. Um, thank you for you know taking the time to talk to us. I wanted to ask. Um, one of my questions is uh, this idea of kind of um, ketamine impacting dendritic spines, increasing complexity, all these sort of things. Um, do we know, or is there any thought or insight into whether these patients that are um, treatment resistant, if before getting ketamine, if their number of spines are lower than average to non-treatment resistant depression versus normal patients, um, like uh, non-depressed patients, uh, or is it that it seems that they just, for some reason, demand more androgenic spine inputs? Um, okay, so so I, I, ha I have two, two thoughts on this. Uh, the first is that it's very difficult to get uh, like like actual uh, was like uh, like counting the number of spines in 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 in, in living people. Uh, so like there there are some techniques now that are using uh, like like radio labeled uh, receptor ligands for 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 example like what's called sb 2 a So it's a protein that that target uh, that it's a uh, a transmembrane protein within the synaptic physicals. And so you can use this as a measure for the number of synaptic terminals. So it's not spines, it's the presynaptic terminal. Uh, there, the, like, there, there, like there are some studies like uh, looking at spines uh, with, like with schizophrenia, they found like a, redu a reduction in their, in their number. There is a current study that's going on at, at Yale that's looking at like with, with depression, is this, with depression and ketamine, is this the case or not? So far, seeing that there are like that the that they can see an increase in the number in patients with ketamine. However, to to clarify, like is there like a like a like at baseline between like controls versus depressed patients or depressed patients and patients with fever resistant depression? This has not been done yet. I think it is possible to like we now we have the tools uh, again like similar to like using like pet like pet pet legend pet legends for that, but has not has not been been done yet. My, my second thought about it is that it might be the case that it's not that like the numbers in general are less, but the number for this particular person are are less. So I think that, and this would clear like would highlight the need for like within subject studies. So like like yes, we are usually used to uh, like comparing uh, like a group of controls versus a group of patients. However, each patient with, with or and each and every control within themselves 
can have a different different number. And what you would require would be like more of a longitudinal study, doing a particular intervention, so as to see like how does the number within within a person change up or down. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. I had one other um, question. So, do you think that this uh, kind of finding uh, with dendritic spines and ketamine suggests a heterogeneity in depression, uh, like uh, root causes of depression, or um, do you think these are kind of just like higher grade, like targeting or more effective targeting of this underlying mechanism? So I guess a possible way of uh, flipping it is, uh, do patients that are non-resistant uh, to medication, if they're given ketamine, do they have the same effects on those patients as treatment resistant. So you, you mean like like patients who are not treatment resistant, so like ha using this as a, as, a, as a first, like as a first line of treatment? Yes. So does that work on them? Or if, if not, I think that would suggest that there's different mechanisms at hand. And so maybe treatment res resistant depression isn't so much resistant to treatment, but just resistant to the wrong treatment, right? To the wrong treatment, yeah. So, so, so I'm not aware of a study where they use ketamine as a first line. Um, just like it's like in the, like the, uh, the 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 one like ketamine itself like when given like it's need to be given intravenously and like the Jensen one uh, like given intravenously is extremely expensive so it's usually not used as a first line so I don't so that it has not to my knowledge it has not been a study that's that tested this on on, on the first uh, like on the first. Uh, like first episode, or like patients who had not received other other treatments before, uh, like the uh, like the the, the uh, like another thought related to that is that like these patients, like the patient who has failed, or like the, the patient with treatment refractory depression, they like they have been given serotonergic um, treatments and they did not like they feel that they also have been given like dopaminergic and noradrenergic, so like they have been given like different neurotransmitters that still did not help with that. So. I think, like for like the the notion that you can have in these in, in a group of at least a group of these patients can respond to ketamine and that the response is within twenty four hours, highlights to us that like probably ketamine is working at something that's much closer to the mechanism of the depression, rather than that you're working at something that like takes two to three weeks for a downstream effect to take place. So, uh, so, so you think that it that possibly this treatment is more potent rather than working at a different kind of mechanism uh yes working at a different like root cause of depression uh e yes and i think like the, the the supporting evidence for that is that with other treatments like with with like in patients who were sorry in animal models of depression who had been given uh like ssris or or like neurodegenerative or dopaminergic like after a few weeks you're gonna start seeing an increase in the number of spines so it's like the underlying mechanism of the pathology is more or less the same. What results in like some patients developing depression and other people not, so like the etiology, so not the mechanism, is is like is varies a lot. Like there's a genetic element to it, there is a lot of environmental factors in it, there's like a lot of like effect of adverse childhood experiences in it. So like all of these things would result in like like a very like a, like a, a as a first approximation, you can think of like whatever is causing like chronic like a, a negative response to chronic stress with elevated or cort elevated cortisol levels. Cortisol would start like uh, like would trigger pathways that would I don't know, like the word that comes from like eat out at the at the spines and eat out at the at the at the dendrites. So anything that results in some in a chronic stress to the, like to that extent where people also are like they do not have enough. Uh, like uh, like um, support system within the environment that allows them to go beyond this chronic stress, they would develop something si like that might be similar, which is like a reduction in spines. However, like also a point to highlight is that it seems that like in, even like in schizophrenia, there is a reduction in number of spines. It depends on like which region, which uh, with like are we talking about more of the apical dendrites or the basal dendrites? Are we talking about the more of like certain regions in the neocortex versus the versus like the hippocampus and like all of this by the way like it assumes that the neocortex is what's is what's important in depression but there is evidence that like other other areas for example like 
uh, like like how does this affect like the thalamus or the striatum? And it's it's like usually like is like I would like to extend the thought that it's not in the, the cortex. Like the cortex is just part of a loop. That like uh, like a, like a, the cortical striatum cortical loop. So it's part of a loop. And whether the ketamine is affecting other changes, uh, like changes in other areas, might be the case. So far, there's a, has been a lot of focus because of how fast the the antidepressant effect has been. On, on, on the neocortex. Okay, thank you. I think we have a question from Bill. Oh, okay. <laughs> you might know him. Uh, I think oh, I yeah. Do. Hi, Mohammed. That's a fantastic talk. Um, so I misunderstood probably at the beginning. I thought you were going to do a comparison between uh, increased number of spines and increased number of oblique dendrites. But then I didn't uh, of the of the apical see that. Is that, I just misunderstood probably. No, no, no. You, you, no, you're, yeah. you're right. So it's increased number of spines versus increased number of like increased connectivity because of increased uh, apical dendrite arborization. Okay, and so were you able to compare them and decide it was one, not the other, and how did you make that comparison? The, so, so that so that that's the that's the plan. Like like we what we oh, okay. Yeah. So. so the, what we're what we're going to be looking at would be the timing of the different peaks as well as the amplitude of the different peaks and whether they, these and whether varying uh, the, like varying having these two different models would affect the peaks or not. So we're starting first from from the from the model. If we're able to pick up changes, then we we we'll look at whether these changes are there. In each oh, cool! Um, and then following up on the question that was just asked, I mean, it seems like you have. A potential biomarker, of course, it's always so hard to find biomarkers in psychiatry of possibly a variant of depression, especially since you can perhaps, of course, you've got an end of two, you need an end of 20, tie it to a electrophysiological phenomenon. So I was wondering if you were going to think about, you know, following up on other possible biomarkers as well as uh, symptomatic markers that could help you separate these two groups. That would be a fantastic thing. And of course, also eventually the model would follow that. Uh, so, so like when you say like symptomatic, you mean like like behavioral tasks, or you mean? Uh, well, like, uh, yeah, I mean behavioral tests would get at the symptomatology, right? Um, and then you have the potential for various signs, and I don't actually know what those might be for depression, but uh, you know, a variety of ERPs, perhaps any kind of indication in the CF CSF. I don't know, uh, but anyway, the just to collect data and see if there's anything else that will stratify along these two groups that you've just discovered, and which have this neat uh, electrophysiology. Uh, I, I mean, we're like we're we're planning on getting like like blood levels of of like BDNF, for example, like brain drive neurotrophic factor. There has been some work before that shows like the the like ketamine, uh, like patients who respond to ketamine have a high, like have higher BDNF after. Uh, after receiving ketamine, so BDF seems to be an important modulator for the, for the, its effect, and like checking how this would translate then to um, like to to the EEG or how it would correlate with the EEG changes that we would see. Yes, uh, and uh, uh, like we're like we're working with, like we're we got the IRB approval. We're starting recruiting like next week, so uh, hopefully we'll we'll have some more data. Okay. And ideally, you'll want the the pre uh, pre treatment markers as well. Yes. Yeah, like, like a baseline, yes. Very cool. Thank you, Bill. So it's like, a, for people who don't know, like, Bill, Bill was my, my PhD supervisor. Uh. So, any other questions? Hi, I have one. Uh, that was a really Hi. interesting talk. This is, this is kind of like the field of modeling I want to go into. Um, but I was wondering, like, when modeling depression, anxiety, or any other psychiatric disorders, what kind of, like... Sorry, I'm just like, this is oh. just, like, it's an alarm, like, okay, like, you have to finish now, so... Like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, what kind of, how granular do you get, and how, like, what can cause some of those disorders in individuals? Because it can be, like, some of it is kind of, like, the nature versus, versus nurture and that it is genetic and stuff like that. But it can be, like, um, individual experiences. So how do you take that into account when modeling kind of the whole disorder? So I, 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 th I mean, you're, you're right. It, it, like the, the etiology or like how, how the, how we end up with these, with these disorders is quite complex. And I think what, like, 
like people looking at etiology, like you said, like the effect of niche versus nurture, or the like with the genome wide association size, so like the genetic influence, they are like, they are looking at the what we consider as the etiology, the, the what tar what triggers this, what's what predisposes for this. What I think because of it's a bit, I don't want to say easier, but like it's a it's a bit different when we have a patient with a disorder now. So we're like like we're dealing with kind of like the end result. For sure, there would be there are people working on like preventative measures on like how to pre how to reduce the like the influence of, for example, adverse childhood experiences on on people and how and even like not just at like like in terms of like. Uh, uh, like supportive therapy, but in terms of like system level wise, like how to provide, for example, parents with adequate time to take care of their children, how like and so like at the, at the systems level. So in like if uh, like this is not my like like it's a very important part of what we do as clinicians, but as as research, I'm more focused on the microcircuit piece. How to take that into account, like if I'm trying to, okay, like uh, back to what, like the term that you use, like how granular do we get in like in the different models would depend on the question that we're trying to answer. And like one of the favorite things, like the like, like things that I still remember so much from, from Bill, in addition to like everything else, like this would not have been possible without like Bill, uh, is like, like the, the, the model, like the model depends on the question that we're trying to answer. So we have as much as much detail of as as, as much detail as possible, as need, as much detail as needed, but not more than that. So for example, like if I'm not, let's say, if I'm not uh, investigating, uh, um, like, like if, I'm not, if, if I don't have a way to tackle a particular interneuronal subpopulation. I, like either medication wise or like there's no specific like electrophysiology marker I would not have that and it's not important for my, for the research question I'm trying to get at I'm not gonna add that there so it's it, like usually the I don't think that there would be one model for depression there would be a mul multitude of, of models depending on the research question that we're trying to answer uh, each one of them is simple enough to understand and complex enough to have the details that we care about does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. All right. sure. I was just wondering, Mohammed, following up on that, if people have connected this to the lack of spines and the understimulated mouse, I think that would be William Greeno and others that have studied that in the uh, development. So, 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 like for for that, like what 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 would come to mind would be like ad, like adverse childhood experiences, and there is a group that's trying to study uh, adverse child, like like. Uh, People who have been exp exposed to adverse childhood experiences, so like emotional abuse, emotional neglect, physical abuse, and and EEG. Uh, work, like I'm working with somebody here at, at, at Brown analyzing EEG data set from like two two groups with or control and people who have been exposed to trauma. Uh, we're not yet do, like doing the treatment part. Uh, we're but 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 that that's like that's the goal or that's the aim is trying to take into account. Not, is trying to study what would be the electrophysiological changes that would happen in the brain based on uh, like things like uh, like the, the 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 nurture piece of the nature versus nurture. I I had another question. Um, if no one else has any, um, I I was wondering. Uh, do you know if um, IV ketamine or the uh, intranasal ketamine if they have similar constellation of side effects to other antidepressants. Um, I, I know so, a lot have, you know, common common uh, side effects of like weight gain, um, sexual dysfunction, those sort of things. Uh, and I'm wondering if those sort of carry on in those two. So, so, so far it like, it, so ketamine or intranasal ketamine, ha like the, the, the side effects, you can think of them as, so, so the way it's given, the way it's like the way ketamine or, or, or in terms of as ketamine is given, is it has to be in in a like in a clinic or in a healthcare facility. Like you don't have it, like you don't get it, take it to, to home with you and like receive it there. Uh, and the effects that people experience is like for the first roughly forty minutes to an hour, they have dissociative effects. So like experiencing that like the colors are brighter, that they can hear a lot of the like of the sounds in the background so much like the EC, like very much at the, at, on the foreground. Uh, sometimes people describe like I, I'm feeling like, as if like I'm going through a tunnel. So like there are like dissociative effects. People call this either, either dissociative effects or psychedelic and spiritual meaningful experiences, depending on who you ask. Uh, so, 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 but, but the effects go away within, within 
15, 30 minutes max. So I like so people pe patients come and stay with us for two hours before they leave. All of this has been cleared. So so the, so they like so these side effects do not carry over. Some of like like other side effects would be something like like so like like trying to answer your your like your, your like your question more precise. Like there is no weight gain. There is no sexual side effects that come from ketamine. Uh, so far, the side effects seems to be related to uh, like uh, like people developing like some like urinary bladder irritability, but but this is like in a very small number of patients. Uh, so overall, and like com like com like there are some people like there was some worry about like whether it's resulting like excited toxicity or not because of the higher dose of ketamine this might happen seems to like not to be the case. Like so, in order to, for Janssen to get the FDA approval, they had they ran. There are studies on around fifteen hundred patients, and like like the side effects have been relatively benign. Uh, so like no, so they would not carry over. Any other questions? Okay. okay. So thank you so much. You have a couple of comments here in the chat. Yes. Saying thank okay. you, great talk. Thank you very much. Really interesting talk. Amazing presentation. Really interesting presentation. And everybody's thank you. Thank you so much again. It's a great opportunity. I'm very excited that like we're like like there are people like more and more people interested in modeling and using that by this facility. Uh, thank you again. Thank you so much, Maha. Right. It's great. Have a great one. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.